Um, hello, I'm Jim Walsh. I'm the Policy Director for Food and Water Watch. Thank you for joining us today for this important briefing on concerns with carbon dioxide injection wells. This briefing was prompted by recent disclosures of well failures and releases of carbon dioxide at an ADM facility in Illinois and numerous failing injection wells in Texas that are raising significant concerns about the safety and long-term viability of underground carbon dioxide storage. These leaks highlight critical risks to public health, environmental safety, and the feasibility of large-scale carbon capture and storage initiatives. These leaks are what to led to over 150 organizations calling on EPA to halt injections of carbon dioxide into existing wells and put existing permits for carbon dioxide injections on hold. And along with Food and Water Watch, this briefing is co-hosted by the Climate Justice Alliance, Center for Biological Diversity, the Eco Justice Collaborative, Great Plains Action Society, CURE, and the Institute for Policy Studies Climate Policy Program. We have a number of esteemed speakers today, including Pam Richard, land use and environmental planner who co-directs the nonprofit Eco Justice Collaborative, who's based in Campaign, or, uh, Champaign, Illinois, who's also been really closely tracking the developments of well failures at ADM. Paige Powell, Senior Policy Manager at Commission Shift, who's going to discuss finding and concerns with the injection well programs in Texas. Richard Kuperwitz, President of Acufax and Chemical Engineer, who's going to talk about issues of corrosion from CO2 and steel and wells. Maria Nunez Lopez, uh, uh, who is a member of the White House Environmental Justice Advisory Council and board member of the Climate Justice Alliance. Paul Blackburn, attorney and consultant with extensive knowledge of carbon capture industry and tax credits. We'll post the full bios uh, in chat. Um, and the speakers have also provided handouts to supplement their remarks, which we'll also put into chat. Um, now we're going to get to our first speaker, uh, Pam Richard, uh, land use and environmental planner from Eco Justice Collaborative, to discuss the leaks in Illinois. Pam, I'll hand it over to you. Jim, and thank you for uh, being here, everybody. This is uh, an important issue that uh, has taken on, I think, an urgency. Uh, so I, I'm really glad you're here. So uh, the opening slide, uh, the leaks. We're going to talk about the leaks today. What we think ADM knew and when did they know it? What did ADM share with the EPA? Why did the agency take so long to act? And can CO2 leaks affect public health and safety? I'm just going to say with respect to that first slide, the first two questions are kind of rhetorical. We don't really have all the answers to them. The last one, we pretty much know what uh, CO2 can do to public health and safety, and perhaps we'll want to talk a little bit more about that after uh, uh, when we get to Q&A. Next slide, please. So a little bit of context here. Uh, what you're seeing on the left is a map of the area of review in green, the pressure front in, uh, in pink, and the yellow footprint is the ultimate plume as it's protected to be, uh, at, at its position is, is modeled to be, shall I say, uh, in 2075. If you look really closely on that left map, you can see four colored dots, the first two, are the are yellow and they uh, represent the, uh, the the CCS one project, the first project. The green is the the project that we're going to be talking about. So each of those projects had 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 uh, one well. Uh, the second one, which is commercial scale, which began in 2017, actually was using both wells. So both wells at ADM's sequestration facility leaked, as you can see here. And uh, the concern that, that many of us have is that this project, which is hailed as the most successful in the country, uh, leaked right away and has hardly stored any CO2. Uh, the first project, 1 million metric tons, that was their pilot project. And the second one to date is storing about half of what it expected to store. Uh, and, and we're now looking at an additional 3.5 million metric tons. Not a lot of CO2 stored, two leaks. Next slide, please. So what happened? This is my attempt to put a timeline together, and it's not just to tell you something that's uh, chronological, although that's important, but also to give you some context along the way. So what we know, and we know this from a couple sources, uh, source number one is the annual reports provided to the EPA. 
Source number two is the uh, response ADM provided to the EPA uh, with respect to the EPA's in injection uh, report. And source number three is some conversations that colleagues of mine actually had with ADM. Uh, one of the things that I think is important to share is I was part of a negotiation process for the CCS, the CCS Protections Act, our bill on sequestration that was signed by the governor in, in, in July. So uh, some of our colleagues, and it wasn't me, met with ADM after the leak. I met with ADM beforehand as part of that negotiating process. But anyway, within three years, we got a leak, right? Uh, we've got a malfunctioning well. Uh, by November of 2021, uh, that well is experiencing su uh, surface leaks. And another one uh, that happened in June that I don't think I put here. Uh, in, um, in 2021 sometime, maybe early 22, it's not real clear to me, uh, there were characteristics of CO2 contamination detected in the Ironton Galesville's formation above the confining zone. That's pretty early, right after a project uh, uh, of this minor scale starts. Uh, by January 2022, uh, ADM knows their, their monitoring well is totally malfunctioning. They described it as the, the dials were spinning like, you know, every, everywhere uh, they, they could no longer use it. Uh, the a meet, they meet with the EPA in February. Um, and I believe the attempt was to try to repair and restore the well. In 2022, according to their own reports, they detected a subsurface leak. Um, and by October, and I don't know what happened between 2022 and October, uh, we don't have that information, but finally ADM decides to plug their well. Uh, that's when they pulled the assembly, that's when they discovered the corrosion, and that's when the well became non-functional. Next slide, please. So uh, by March, now we know from the reporting that happened uh, by e NE News Political that ADM had identified a new leak. Uh, does this mean the well that was plugged continued to leak? Does this mean this was formation fluid from the leak that was still observable from the 22 leak? I don't really know. Uh, what I do know is the EPA inspected the wells in June and by August, they issued a notice of violation and the story was broken uh, the following September. And in uh, September uh, on 19th, 18th, the EPA issued a proposed order on consent. Next slide, please. So one of the questions that, that I think many of us have when we look at this timeline and you look at the fact that it is true. We we know we just talked about the the failures of, of ADM with respect to their monitoring well uh, and and keeping it in in a uh, uh, in a workable uh, format here. Uh, we didn't talk about the failure to to follow the emergency response plan, and that plan, as I read it, would have required ADM to stop injecting anytime there's failure fluid that is detected. And I think coupled with the failure of the the uh, the total failure of their monitoring well, they should have stopped injecting. Why did they not stop injecting? And why didn't the EPA uh, ask them to do it? And why didn't they issue a notice of violation sooner? Those are questions that I think uh, remain unanswered. And I think we deserve to have answers to those questions. Next slide, please. So by September 19th, we've got the proposed order on consent. And uh, I think there's a couple things here that are worth noting. They couldn't repair the monitoring well the first time. Uh, they tried, it, they, totally, they totally took it apart. I, I'm not so sure how we could uh, repair the well now, knowing that we've got corrosion and a failure of 13 chrome steel. But this is what the EPA is, being, uh, is asking ADM to do. Uh, probably should be replaced. I don't know how they could do anything else. Uh, the questions about the extent of the leak and making sure that CO2 is no longer leaking dovetail with what uh, colleagues of mine were told. They don't know for sure. Uh, the EPA is asking them, how much? And is it still leaking? You have to demonstrate that it is not, uh, not leaking any longer. And you also have to show us there's no pathways for CO2 to escape now that CO2 has left the permitted uh, confinement zone. I'm not so sure that I understand how they'll do this with a monitoring well that's done down and another one that we'll talk about secondly, they're thinking about plugging, uh, but this is what they're being required to do. So again, 
they were not asked to stop injecting CO2. Uh, ADM has not has has voluntarily uh, uh, paused injection, but I do not understand why the EPA didn't ask them to do it. It was clearly, you know, what we experienced with formation fluid and, and the and the well failure was clearly a violation of their permit. Next slide, please. So what happened? This is really, really interesting to me. So uh, we're talking about using the best available technology. Uh, 13 chrome steel, which we now know is vulnerable to corrosion. And I think some of us on this uh, panel probably would have said we've known that for a while. Uh, and But the interesting thing about their design is that they had an opportunity to open sleeves at the bottom here before, below the shale rock and, and at the top. And essentially what happened is once the well began to corrode and malfunction, uh, the uh, the brine and the CO two were able to move up the the shaft uh, and and escape through this this top hole into the into the confining layer. ADM said they'll never use that design again, but that was considered to be a good design and best technology. And I say that because. Technology evolves, right? And so as, as we're looking at what is considered best today, uh, we don't know if it's really gonna be suitable for tomorrow. Next slide, please. Then it happened again, which I, I just mentioned. Now we have their monitoring well uh, for their first project, which was really doing the heavy lifting for uh, monitoring what's going on at their second project. That too is leaking. They say there's no signs of well corrosion. They say they're not sure if it's CO2. It could be just brine. It, they say it also escaped into the Ironton Galesville uh, formation above the cap rock. They say they don't know how much leaked. They don't, they don't know where it's moving, but they have stopped injection. Uh, and they are considering plugging the well, which would leave this without uh, any monitoring at all. Uh, next slide, please. No one notified the public. The emergency response plan does not require ADM to notify a public, the public, unless it is a major uh, uh, scale event. And this one didn't qualify for that. But here's the problem. The city of Decatur was negotiating easements with ADM to store CO2 under Lake Decatur. And they were doing those negotiations while the well was leaking. Uh, Illinois bill, which I mentioned before, was being negotiated and it passed between April and May of 2024. ADM knew their well was leaking. They said nothing, nothing to Decatur, nothing to the negotiating team, nothing to the legislators. Governor Pritzker signed the bill at Decatur's uh, CCS Research and Development Center on Ju July 18th, like a half a mile away from the well that was leaking. Uh, again, ADM knew their monitoring well had failed. They knew they had failed the AEPA inspections, but they said nothing. So I think these actions clearly show lack of transparency uh, to the public and to the state. And those decisions could have changed had, had information been shared. You know, how, maybe we would have decided to hold off passing that regulatory bill until we had answers to these questions. Maybe, maybe Decatur City Council would have said, no, until we know better what's going on, we're not gonna, we're not gonna sign those easements with you. It also shows the inability to fix the problem. Uh, they have not been able to to fix the monitoring well, uh, and now we have a second well that is leaking that they they are not, uh, I don't believe, uh, looking at fixing now. They're going to be plugging it. And of course, it shows, uh, I believe, the inability to safely store CO2. There's no certainty that we can store it and permanently store it underground, at least where we are with technology today. Next slide, please. Almost finished here. Um, okay, time. Okay. So public health and safety. This is something that I think we'll, we'll, we'll look at uh, later uh, if we can with the questions, but I think it's an important thing. The other slide, next slide, please, I'd like to show uh, here is that it's happening at an unprecedented scale in Illinois. Next slide, please. Uh, the uh, projects under view in Illinois are over 100 times larger than Decatur's facility. And last slide, uh, I think the other thing that maybe we could talk about here is that uh, we're looking at this under a, a soil source aquifer uh, in Illinois and potentially could be looking at uh, other soil source aquifer, aquifer uh, risks as well. And a soil source means that if it's contaminated, there's no readily available of, of, uh, supply of water to replace it. And that's it. So thank you much.
Thank you so much, Pam, for sharing those important remarks and uh, really your work documenting um, all of the uh, what we know and, and really don't know with this incident. It's it's really concerning to hear about the history of this project and the lack of notification to the community. And this is particularly concerning when we consider the threats to drinking water and and the concerns that we're about to hear from Paige uh, about the carbon dioxide injection well failures uh, in Texas. And so with that, I'll um, bring up next is Paige Powell from Commission Shift, who's going to discuss concerns with the leak in Texas and um, also the pending applications in front of EPA to turn over permitting authority to Texas for injection wells. So uh, Pam, I'll, or Paige, I'll turn it over to you. Thank you. Thank you, Jim, for having me. And thank you, everyone, for your attention to this really important matter. Uh, could we go to the next slide, please? So I wanted to speak to um, Texas, the Railroad Commission of Texas Underground Injection Control Program actively failing to protect underground sources of drinking water. Next slide. Um, in Texas, and I think you can go a, a few slides in, we have um, about 8,000 orphan wells in the state that the Railroad Commission of Texas is um, actively working to plug. More orphan wells come online every year than are plugged. But the real problem lies with the over 100,000 inactive wells that have active operators but are actively unplugged and leaking methane, VOCs, and other um, sort of um, air air pollutants and possibly contaminating underground sources of drinking water as well. Um, no other well more encapsulates this issue of orphan and abandoned wells than um, the one flowing Sloan Blair over at Lake Beamer in Pecos County, which has been flowing at a rate of about 200 gallons a minute for the last 20 years. And the Railroad Commission of Texas, the state's oil and gas agency, claims no jurisdiction over plugging this well because no hydrocarbons were found when it was initially drilled, and so it was plugged and transferred to the landowner as a water well. It's now under the jurisdiction of the Texas Commission on Environmental Quality. Um, but since hydrocarbons and um, sulfur dioxide have are coming out of this well actively, there remains some dispute over who really um, needs to plug this multi-million dollar liability and the blight on the landscape of Texas. Next slide, please. Um, so what we're seeing right now with the underground injection control program is overpressurization of the subsurface due to disposal of wastewater, produced water from enhanced oil recovery activities, as well as CO2 EOR um, that's contributing to some of these subsurface blowouts. Um, it's pretty evident through um, the um, geysers that you can see here. This one was from 2022. There was another one in uh, late December last year, I think, which carried on through January. And uh, again, most recently, one actively flowing over um, in, in West Texas right now. I think we have a link to the most recent Houston Chronicle article um, speculating on sort of the cause, root cause of this most recent uh, wastewater geyser, right, that's overflowing. Um, we're seeing subsidence and uplift from these injection activities. We're seeing sinkholes form and cracks open up in the land, which really just speaks to um, the failure to regulate injection and management of the subsurface of those sort of saline formations, which are holding things together, now starting to fall apart. Uh, next slide, please. Um, we're seeing sinkholes um, around the Houston area as well. This was from um, a class three um, brine mining injection well, which there was a huge sinkhole that opened up many years ago. It sort of stopped. And then all of a sudden, 20 years later, began to open up again and a secondary sinkhole formed nearby. This is in the town of Deseta, which is just northeast of Houston, um, where I live. And uh, we're just really concerned about this because when you, know, you think you have something under control, when a sinkhole stops growing, and then all of a sudden starts growing again 20 years later, it's pretty telling that there are things happening in the subsurface that the operators are not aware of, the regulators are not aware of. And so what we're asking for is better oversight and management of these injection control programs to mitigate the harmful effects on land, on drinking water resources, and on communities. Next slide, please. 
Um, we've also seen unprecedented un induced seismicity in recent years um, with uh, earthquakes becoming more and more frequent and growing in magnitude. We're getting magnitude five earthquakes on a regular basis at this point. And the Railroad Commission of Texas, the state's oil and gas agency, has had to institute seismic response areas to control injection weights and flow volumes. They've even restricted permitting of um, wastewater disposal in the subsurface, leading to what some are calling a produced water disposal crisis in West Texas, whereby the 20 million plus barrels of produced water that need to be disposed of every day just don't have room to go underground anymore. And so that'll lead them to be being disposed of in waste pits where they're left to evaporate, possibly um, migrate into the subsurface and drinking water resources, and also have um, the noxious effect of, of having those toxic gases uh, migrate on the wind to uh, nearby communities. Next slide, please. Uh, we're seeing that this crumbling um, infrastructure is failing um, over and over again, even wells that have been plugged and abandoned, theoretically properly plugged and abandoned, are now crumbling and blowing out, um, impacting the land and um, the water resources of the region. Next slide. Um, so we're really concerned um, in October, uh, just last, uh, well, I want to step back. Um, earlier in March of this year, Commission Shift, Clean Water Action, Earth Justice, and a number of other local organizations in our coalition sent um, a petition to the EPA begging for them to investigate Texas Class II program due to mismanagement and violation of the Safe Drinking Water Act, as was evidenced by all of the things I just mentioned. Um, more recently, we sent another follow-up letter to EPA. This was um, in response to Environmental Integrity Project's investigation, which found that um, there was a severe, a dramatic increase in um, severe noncompliance violations starting in 2011, and that the, the injection wells, which used CO2, um, failed one or more integrity mechanical integrity tests at twice the rate, more than twice the rate of non-CO2 injection wells, that 20% of CO2 injection wells had failed one or more mechanical integrity tests, whereas only 9% of regular UIC wells did not. Next slide. And so um, this really leads us to beg the question, if the RRC can't properly manage aging and crumbling wells and is actively mismanaging its class two program, what's going to happen to these larger high pressure, high consequence class six disposal wells? Next slide. Um, so in the last year or two, we've been pulling together a coalition of organizations to fight um, the primacy determination here in the state of Texas. Next slide. Um, we're asking for the EPA to deny the Railroad Commission's application for primacy due to all of the concerns um, for mismanagement of its UIC programs to date. Next slide. And um, I hope that if you have any questions, um, feel free to ask. Thank you. Thank you so much, Paige, for that excellent presentation. It's really clear that states are even less equipped to equip to oversee this industry than EPA at this point. And the last thing that we should be doing is handing over more authority to states like Texas, where public officials have a long history of putting the interest of oil and gas companies above the health and well-being of their residents. Uh, thank you for, for sharing those, those important remarks. Um, next, we'll turn it over to Richard Kupowitz to discuss specific issues of corrosion, uh, the steel used in these injection wells. Uh, Richard, turn it over to you. Thank you, and thank you for having me on board here. Interesting presentations. Uh, I'm president of Acufax Incorporated. Uh, next slide, please. I represent over 50 years experience, including incident command for various failures, 25 plus years in failure investigation, especially in pipeline safety regulatory development. And uh, sadly, in the last 25 plus years, I've investigated too many failures that were all preventable. Next slide, please. The recent discoveries that you just heard earlier uh, are showing up as a surprise, especially so-called corrosion resistant components are failing from carbo carbonic acid attack. Anybody that knows you put CO2 and water together, you get carbonic acid. 
and it has an extreme affinity to want to attack and corrode steel. Uh, now, the higher chrome steels are supposedly ha have resistance to that corrosion, but a couple other factors uh, raise questions about why are these uh, corrosion resistant components failing? And one of the questions could be, uh, you know, are the failed components on specification? Did they specify uh, the right components and did they receive and install the right components? And anybody who ever, you know, wants to ask about or question that is go ask Boeing about components that didn't meet the grade that they thought they were getting, all right? Uh, in these cases of failures, my experience would tell me temperature probably plays a more slight, uh, likely playing a significant training factor. The higher the temperature, uh, reaction rate, what engineers like chemical engineers who are experienced in this will understand, you know, the higher the temperature, there's a formula that we use that accelerates corrosion. Uh, something like every 18 degrees Fahrenheit increase doubles the rate of corrosion from the previous point. And obviously, as you're, you know, no surprise here, but wells are not well, re well regulated. Next slide, please. A question on these injection wells that I would, as a system expert looking at various failure modes, is how many independent levels of protection are there to prevent heavier than air CO2 releases from the reservoir, which is essentially going to be an infinite source of CO2? How many do you have? If they have one level of protection, no matter how good that component is, that's not a good design. And, and you need to think about that. And then obviously the fundamental question, who's really regulating such unique injection wells? And it doesn't take many people to figure out. The reality is no one is, you know, they, they may talk about it, but the reality is, is there isn't a follow up in, on those things. More information needs to be made public to ensure transparency and appropriate solutions. Uh, are developed and approached, uh, and transparency is a key. Person, uh, a company doing the right thing should have no problem telling you and showing you how he's doing the right things. And I think that's about it. Next slide. Yep. Thank you very much. Yeah, thank you so much, Richard. I appreciate you coming on here to uh, share your expertise. And uh, it really... Um, raises some questions about uh, your particular comparison to the airline industry and, um, you know, supplied components and things and the lack of regulation and oversight that we're seeing in this, this industry um, really highlights the, the concerns that the other speakers have brought up here today. Um, next, we're going to um, have uh, Maria Lopez Nunes uh, on to uh, talk about um, the recent uh, uh, recommendations from the White House Environmental Justice Advisory Council, where she is a member of the Carbon Management Working Group and a member of the larger council. And Maria, thank you so much for being here today. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Yes, it, it's really disturbing um, to hear, you know, more in depth about all the problems with injection wells. So let me back up here. I'm Maria Lopez Nunez. I am actually one of the co-chairs of the Carbon Management Work Group. And uh, this past June, we issued our second set of recommendations, even though they were just made public more recently in October. Um, that was driven by uh, the council's extreme concern that car all sorts of carbon management, right, whether it be direct air capture, um, whether it be hydrogen, direct, uh, direct in, uh, injection wells, all those sorts of technologies that fall under what the EPA is now just classifying as carbon management, um, pose a threat and a concern for environmental justice communities throughout the country. And so with, with that in mind, we did issue uh, cross-cutting recommendations that deal with hydrogen, you know, that deal with TCS, that deal with um, the EPA, uh, especially, you know, our concern heavily is on this issue of primacy and the fact that states, including, you know, like uh, we heard from one of the previous speakers, the Texas Commission, who by their own admission has, you know, said they're not doing a good job regulating anybody, you know, it, if in... um if agencies at the local level are not doing a good job or so susceptible to corruption, how is it that the EPA is allowing um, primacy to take place, that they are giving over the reins of un for untested, unproven technology that we're still learning so much about and so much of its failures? Um, 
to local actors that are susceptible to corruption and to influence. And so that's been a big concern of our council. It's been a big concern that a lot of, especially with the um, underground injection wells, that they're so close to our drinking water and that their failure could contaminate our drinking water permanently. And so with that, you if you see our report is about 82 pages, you know, we we I do want to stress that we do this report, these reports with very little um technical support. You know, it's all on a volunteer basis. So even today I've heard things. I'm like, wow, I wish we would have included those things in, in our report. But we did our best. And some of our recommendations, of course, are for EPA really to rethink this um uh to rethink primacy. EPA has no way to even double check. Um, if states that is giving primacy to are gonna do are doing a good job currently, have done a good job in the past. Um, and so we do think that EPA should figure out ways to claw back primacy from states, especially when major environmental justice concerns are um arising. There needs to be better ways for environmental justice communities to interact with projects. Right now, if we see um if we follow the examples that we're seeing on the hydrogen end, communities are being asked to do subscription models where they have to pay um companies for information on what is going on next door. We are finding that there is nothing publicly available on their um on the types of projects that are being slated to come into communities. So we're extremely concerned about the expansion of projects under CCS under um carbon management, the carbon management umbrella. And so with that, you know, there needs to be a more clear cut way on, for communities to have a voice, uh, for there to be no goals, right? The Department of Energy, when we met with them, said that the communities could, you know, weigh in, but those are, it's very obscure where communities would actually be able to weigh in if another project is slated to come into their um backyard. On on the topic of um, carbon management, you know, right now there's no way to say that the pilot projects, uh, aside from right now, the very public failure of some of them, it's been very hard for the WeJack and for members of the public to, to get information on ongoing projects, to see where they are, to see, you know, more of the nitty gritty details. And a lot of that is protected by the Department of Energy because it does uh, consider it industry secrets, right? And so that creates a, a lack of transparency that could really harm communities um, that the WeJack is especially concerned about, that we can't even have informed consent for projects that might go into someone's backyard if we can't get all the proper information. We do believe that EPA should suspend, quite frankly, completely suspend the issuing of um, class six permits on uh, carbon management technologies and so it's really completed um, proper rulemaking um, to make that transparency and meaningful engagement more clear. And right now, communities are very unaware of the risk posed by projects that might be in their backyard or coming to their backyard. The Department of Energy's and, uh, quite frankly, industry's concept of risk does not include like what happens if a well fails, if carbon is leaked um, into the atmosphere. A lot of local authorities, um, like we saw in um, in 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 Mississippi, a lot of local authorities don't know what to do when things fail. So you know, we think that there needs to be kind of a whole rethinking of how we're going about this, so that communities are a part of the process. Um, I mean. Let me be clear. First, we don't think this should be happening, but we understand that EPA might move forward. And if EPA and Department of Energy are going to move forward, then communities need to be properly informed. And that includes the local emergency department so that they know what to do in the case of a carbon leak and what, you know, what we saw um uh, situations of cars stalling and people passing out, <laughs> that means that the local hospitals also need to be aware of what's going on, you know? So I, um, I'm i very concerned personally. I don't think we know enough just to bring this back. And the, the WeJack has tried to ask questions. It's been very difficult to get information. It's been very difficult to get 
access specifically to projects and to know who they're working with and what that community has been informed of. And we think it's all become very convoluted with the addition of considering that there might be workforce development agreements, you know, so communities might be uh, financially incentivized to accept projects that are not in their maybe health concern or um, long long term concern. So I, you know, I hope that we'll do more briefings on this because I think the world of carbon management needs to be more clearly exposed uh, to the public and that has not happened yet. And so the WeJack will con continue raising up these concerns. And to be clear, we've heard from um, testifiers from all across the country who are worried about this harmful technology, how it might come uh, to a neighborhood near them and how it might pollute their drinking water. We do not have the safeguards in place. Um, and drinking water is, you know, it's sacred. So it's all of our job to protect it and to not be satisfied right now with EPA saying they've done a good job. They've obviously not protected drinking water in the past. And this is a, a, a brand new exponential threat that faces our communities. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Maria, for those remarks. I, and, you know, also for your service to the White House Environmental Justice Advisory Council. I know all of you are working very hard to wrap your head around a very uh, fastly uh, growing industry um, that has uh, significant and adverse impacts on communities and particularly environmental justice communities. And thank you for sharing uh, about that today. Um, next, we're going to uh, turn it over to Paul Blackburn uh, from Bold Alliance, uh, who will discuss implications and concerns with tax credits for carbon capture in light of these uh, well failures. So, Paul, I'll turn it over to you. Thanks for being here today. Yeah, thank you. And thanks, everybody, for watching. Um, so the question is, what does the what do well failures in Illinois and Texas have to do with a with a federal tax credit, particularly the 45Q federal tax credit for carbon sequestration? And let's go to the first slide, please. To the next. Okay, thanks. Um, Congress enacted the 45Q tax credit to encourage development of carbon capture and sequestration facilities. And this is the primary driver by far of all these uh, carbon dioxide capture facilities or capture and sequestration and enhanced recovery facilities. Um, the 45Q tax credit provides a fixed amount of tax relief for each ton of carbon dioxide sequestered or used for enhanced or recovery. It's not just for storing underground, but storing underground with regard to oil recovery as well. The 45Q tax credit is allowed only for carbon, uh, carbon oxides that are placed into, quote, secure geologic, geological storage. And, um, and that's the key word here. So next slide, please. So what does secure geologic storage mean? And I'd like to point out here that, it, well, that, that the purpose of the greenhouse gas carbon sequestration efforts are to keep the carbon out of the atmosphere, not for decades, but preferably for hundreds if not thousands of years. So this is a very different time frame than the regulations were originally designed to consider for, um, for what it means. Anyway, Congress directed the Department of Treasury to consult the EPA to define this term and what it decided to do was to define it as, uh, as CO2 that's injected into a well that complies with the aqua underground injection control or other regulations at facilities that are also in compliance with the um, reporting requirements under 40 CFR part 98 subpart RR. Um, so there's two different sets of requirements here. One is for the underground injection control program and the other one is the reporting requirements under subpart 98 and subpart RR. Um, this applies both to class two wells that are used for enhanced oil recovery and or sequestration. You can put sequestered CO2 in, into a class two well as well as use it for enhanced oil recovery. And it also applies to class, sorry, I got the number there, class six wells used solely for, for carbon sequestration. And I got the, the citations there uh, for the different programs. Next slide, please. So the technical requirements for these class two wells are contained in 40 CFR uh, section um, 146. Um, and that's when you're looking at the well failures in Illinois, for example, or in Texas, 
these wells after 1980 were all built supposedly to to the class two injection wells or class the ones in Illinois are for the class four injection wells and those are under a different part of 146. Um, the class two well standards are rather short and vague. They're only six pages long, and a lot of that's procedural stuff. Um, basically, they just provide some aspirational goals, and then they leave it up to the enhanced recovery developers, well developers, um, broad discretion to figure out how to comply with those with the federal regulations. The class six well standards are somewhat more detailed. Um, they have a little bit clearer aspirational goals, but nonetheless, they still grant sequestration project developers significant discretion. And it's our understanding that the EPA does a fair amount of uh, informal guidance to developers, for example, related to Chrome 13 or Chrome 25 steel, you know, the kind of steel that's used and kind of cement that's used and whatnot, but this is not part of federal regulations expressly. Um, and I should also point out that um, part 146 requirements do not contain specific standards for monitoring wells. If you look at these regulations, they talk all about injection wells. They don't talk about standards for monitoring wells. I assume the monitoring wells are held to the same standards, but again, that's not required by the regulation. Can we go to the next slide. Now, the reporting requirements are um, included in, as I said, 40 CFR part, sub, or part 98. And specifically, the, the IRS's regulations at 26 CFR 1.45Q-3 uh, sub B reference only subpart RR. Um, that's for sequestration. Um, the, the IRS regulations do not reference other parts of the reporting requirements related to other facilities. For example, they don't reference sub, sub, subpart PP related to carbon capture facilities, subpart UU, which is where reporting for CO2 injected for EOR alone is provided, or subpart VV, which is reporting of sequestration into EOR facilities. So 26 CFR 1.45Q-3B is simply outdated. Some of these regulations are just um, amended by federal by final rule in May of this year, but other ones have been in existence for a while. Uh, I don't know why the IRS decided to reference only subpart RR, but they really need to reference other subparts as well. And I also want to point out that the Part 98 regulations do not require technical well do not contain technical well specifications. Let's next 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 slide, please. So what is the, what are the implications of ADM monitoring well failures? And also I'd say the failures in Texas to do with, with the 45Q tax credit. Well, as I said, you know, the 45Q tax credit requires a, that uh, carbon dioxide be stored in quote, secure geological storage. And if the standards um, are not such that they keep it, this, the storage is not secure, then the 45Q tax credit is based on inadequate um, stat, uh, uh, security standards for the CO2 that's going into, into the ground. And I'd also point out that these are new are new purpose-built monitoring wells in Illinois. I mean, they're, they're just, I think one was a little over a decade old and the other one is just a few years old. And they had a claim life, operational life of 30 years. Um, and yet the technology failed. Now, you know, if this pilot project and, and um, you know, it was, was, is failing already, what does that suggest in terms of, what does that imply in terms of the security of geological storage given that EPA's well construction standards? Um, and also, you know, the class six wells, as I said, are supposedly built to higher standards. Well, what about the class two wells? Uh, you know, which are not necessarily built to the same standards. They're, they're really built to maximize oil production and minimize cost to the industry. Um, and, and again, the 146 regulations for class two wells just came into existence in 1980. What about older wells, of which there are many? Um, and I believe before the 1950s, there weren't any even state standards for a lot of these wells or industry standards. They were just built however they wanted to be built. And even if they're even if the wells were built to standards, there's no guarantee that they were constructed to standards or that they are maintained to standards or that they're currently secure. So, you know, for all of these facilities, the enhanced storage recovery facilities and the sequestration facilities, there's a there's a major question about whether the the wells will be secure um, and whether the uh, regulations can ensure secure geologic storage within the meaning of the 45Q statute. And I believe that's all I have. And thank you for your time today.
Thank you very much, uh, Paul, for uh, sharing those remarks. I, I greatly appreciate you taking the time and you bring your expertise to us here today. Um, you know, it really highlights the fact that the carbon capture industry uh, lacks significant oversight, not just at EPA, but really, um, you know, throughout IRS and other parts of the government as well, where um, we really should be expecting more from uh, regulators. And so I, I'm going to thank all of our speakers uh, for these powerful enlightening presentations. It's clear we need EPA to stop injections of C CO2 into existing wells, stop permitting new wells, and stop approval of new primacy applications until we better understand the extent and cause of these leaks. And we have proper regulatory regime in place to protect the public, our drinking water supplies, and what really seem to be systemic leaks of CO2 injection wells. We need congressional action from all the congressional staff and your bosses on the call today to ensure sure EPA is doing more to improve monitoring, oversight, and transparency of injection wells in the country, and ensure that IRS is properly monitoring billions of dollars in tax credits that the industry is working to exploit. And you know, this really raises serious questions about whether the Inspector General should look into numerous questions raised by these leaks, such as why the public was not notified of leaks in Illinois, what the EPA knew when and why it took for so long for EPA to issue a notice of violation, what other leaks EPA knows about about, but they're not sharing with the public, and what leaks may exist that operators are not sharing with the public or EPA. They should also work to understand the full extent of leaking wells and the risk of leaks or potential leaks would have on drinking water and public safety. And thank you all for being here today.